do your shahada, have a shower, ask Allah to forgive you, and pray to rakat or something to, you know, subhanallah, and, and get up for fajr and go and do fajr, inshallah. Stop these things. You know, this evolution and devolution and revolution, all this all these things they're not gonna help you on the day of judgment because you agree yeah because there are certain things for example humans thousand years ago to now are very different how do you know how do you know because, I mean, you have bones right so the on. biggest difference how, is the just height. one second farhan let's let's really understand your concept of evolution what has been different from the previous, you know, thousands of years humans to compare to our human today? What, the height, what difference the do you see? Is the biggest difference. Have you seen some, some human beings which are like four feet tall? Yeah, no. So this is on average, right? You have to take an average no, of the no, beings you don't take which averages. are existing today. No, you don't take averages. Human beings comes in various sizes and shapes. Okay. So this is the first problem you are automatically assuming human beings were different because certain skeleton not even skeleton certain a tooth have been found and they draw the whole human being out of this tooth don't go into this kind of belief system like you know you can have no, a these tooth. Are they found a tooth friend. and they said this is a this is how the human being looked like no, 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 not, not like that. I'm not like right. I'm so tell me what what, what are the differences between human thing. beings today and human beings say, you know, one million years ago. The face of your shape before the shape was more convex. Now it's more either uh, straight. So before seen... it used to be concave. It wait, used to be wait, concave. Wait. Have you the seen face? the faces of human beings across the planet? Yeah. Again, this this falls under. You can see the skull skull bones, right, from previous generations to now you can compare them so and before the before the the cranium was bigger are yeah. you saying the, the human beings were more smarter before that bigger brain no no, no 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 so when i say concave it's because the jawbone was bigger no i'm talking about the brain size the brain size here, was here, bigger here is the problem um brother for so over there the okay. skull was bigger the cranium cavity was not bigger before the cavity, well, no. the, where the brain cavity. is, was not bigger. The skull was well, bigger. How do you know that? The skull size is not that thick before, is it? The skull used to be thicker before compared to not, nowadays. No, in, the skull's job is basically to, you know, safeguard the brain. How different were they yes. in terms of there being a human being? No, so uh, not not so. All of these are not very different. But if we are exactly as Adam, that cannot be the case. That's what I'm saying. There are changes which everyone can see. For example, okay, the now Sheikh, I'll just go to my the, field. The Sheikh, the Sheikh already said that of the hadith of Rasul where Adam was created at 60 cubits tall and people got, um, and mankind got shorter afterwards. So no, well, no one is saying that we are, ex to, as we are today, we were exactly the same at the time of Adam or throughout history. But we've yeah. always been human beings. We were never anything else. Yeah. By the way, what yeah, is your understanding, true. Farhan? What's your understanding of the yes. DNA? In regards to? In regards to the fact that this cannot exist. You know, there's a code in the DNA. So wherever yeah. you see a code, you will see some coder, right? There has to be a coder behind it. Yeah. So see, uh, now if we... Uh, look into this so uh how do i say this forget dna yeah dna is extremely co complex but if you see how the body itself is formed no you can't forget thing, dna one small thing goes wrong brother you cannot forget dna because the dna is the root the basis no, no. Is so what i'm trying to say is of what everything I'm to say including is I agree the genetic with you. changes yeah but i need to understand from your perspective do you think the DNA evolved or did Allah, would Allah be the one who, you know, kind of coded this DNA in a, in a rough language? Who is the originator of this? So see, he's alcoholic. He's, he's created everything. Now, do you know how many yeah. DNA are in your body, by the way? Roughly. 46. No, not chromosomes. chromosomes. That's chromosomes. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. How many how many cells are in your body? Let's start with that. That is billions. Trillions. Yeah, trillions. Okay. So in every human body, there are like a hundred trillion cells. Yeah. And so in in my body and in your body, there are like hundred trillion cells, and this is like the law lo- the largest word that you find. Uh, that's been discovered in the cell, you know, the human genetic code. Yes. And this word consists of 3.4 billion letters long. One word. That's how it looks. You you studied the genetic code, right, in your school days, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Now, if I were to ask you, let's say if I were to ask you randomly, like if somebody had written... Uh, say, for example, the name Farhan on a beach. Yeah. You will automatically say this is linked to an intelligent design or someone who who actually wrote it. You wouldn't say just appeared randomly, is it? So you're saying that there's a literal physical word written on the DNA or? Yes. No, no. Uh, so what I'm saying is that if anyone saw any any word written on a beach, they wouldn't assume that it came about randomly. Yes, you would say true. somebody wrote it, right? Somebody true. intelligent wrote it. Yes. Now, if your human body has a word which is much longer than the name Farhan, the word is like 3.4 billion letters, and it is exactly the same. It's the, the length is exactly the same in every one of those... 100 trillion cells in one body, in one human body. And we are talking about billions of people. Now, automatically, we will say that there must be, it must be linked to an intelligent agent, isn't it? You wouldn't say it just came about randomly. Yeah. I don't think Farhan has a problem with that. No, um, I don't have, exactly. I don't have an issue yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah. So don't... that's what I'm saying. Okay. In terms of evolution, out of these four different options, your safer option now until you research further is Adamic exceptionalism, right? Where Adam Islam was a special creation. Okay. So go into our playlist in the web, uh, in, in our Dawahwise live stream playlist, and you will see that we have an evolution. Dr. Shweb Malik has given you several options. And then when you are ready in terms of understanding the issues of bottleneck and the problem of bottleneck, how this can be avoided, the issues of whether there was an intermarriages between the hominids and the human beings. So Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens as, as a class or genus. Once you can sort out all these problems from the scientific angle, until then you can, you know, just take that position so you don't have any doubt whatsoever because that's one of the position that you know uh to sure Malik has presented that you could take okay it's still okay. within the paradigm of the acceptability um when it comes to evolution in islam as you learn more about these issues and the problems associated with you know just accepting human being as a special creation and how can we reconcile them then of course you can develop further and, and you can have your own understanding of it so unless you go and research to that level you know you can just take one of those options that i've given you now okay so do go and watch those streams and you can contact dr shoaib malik if you would want further information he's available on twitter and he can um, discuss with you if there's any questions so on he's written a book about it also and that book goes into in detail uh, on this issue now following from that onwards now having given you a workable solution with islam and evolution question is there anything else that is causing doubts let's deal yes. with that now yeah thank you so much uh, i will surely go through it and my second issue is the concept of evil now i know also i've again you guys have spoken about this with other people previously it's there on your channels i have gone through it wherein it's basically that if evil doesn't exist it's difficult to appreciate the good so that is not my argument mm-hmm. my argument is again like there are certain conditions wherein a child is born and they are born in such a way that they will suffer throughout their life by certain diseases and this is not like just meager suffering it is palpable suffering so okay. how is it fair 
where some children or some creations have to suffer so much throughout their life or some don't even get to live a life wherein they just die in a few months after being born they have not even lived so how do they get to go to heaven or how is it fair for them where other people don't get to suffer so much sure so hold hold on are you for suffering or against suffering i'm against like against, this is against. one of the other things because again when we you, when you, you, you seem like how, how do they get to heaven your your sorry. your question after you explain about evil sorry about the suffering was how do they get to heaven and the others don't so it seems like you're no, no, how, how do they also get to heaven and somebody who did not suffer so much also sure. gets to heaven yeah let's hear from sheikh ibn hazm on this question and see whether you know you have further questions on this after his explanation sorry, what, what the question, was the question, the question is the question is um unlike the responses or the discussion he hears about the problem of evil he has a specific questions on the problem of evil okay his question is now you have certain people that are born children that are born and they go through extreme tremendous suffering and they may even die after a few hours or a few days and so on how is that fair that's a fair type question the question about you know someone you know when i say it like this and how do they go to heaven for example when they didn't have opportunities for anything this constantly suffering okay have i have i have i understood your question farhan yeah i don't mind they've gone to heaven i'm just like they go to heaven and someone who's lived an entire life without such suffering per se they might have had their own you know problems yeah. okay whatever it is but they got to live an entire life while a baby who's just few days old few hours old as you said could not live at all mm -hmm. where's the justification for like how do we equate both how is it fair basically so explain first of all a baby that bo is born and dies after one hour and may have suffered for example where do you think the baby goes what's the process of no but that's that's what he's asking he's saying how do they go to heaven no no, no i want and him to see what his understanding is then then sheikh can answer so I, after this clarification i believe they go to heaven you believe they go to heaven yes. okay so you're saying it's better to have been born like this with suffering without going into the trials and tribulations no, um, no, no, no. rather than no i'm, I'm just putting it in a broader perspective sorry, sorry. people yeah. live their life 50 years 40 years 100 years to go through so much suffering and or, or not suffering and they may go end up in hell but babies they suffer one hour and they go to heaven that's not fair is that a kind of a question as well no, no not really like okay okay uh, let me then explain it. then what do you mean Leave by fair baby. and okay, unfair in a, in a question about babies what's fair and yeah. what's not fair look uh, uh, br brother mansour before we go any further first of all the aqidah of ahl sunnah wal jama'ah we do not learn shahad we don't testify to anybody for jannah or or jahannam except that which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said or allah jalla wa ala the proof to this the hadith of aisha um al mu'minin radiyallahu anha when a small baby died and she said oh he's a bird from the birds of jannah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told her wa ma adraki now there is a different there is a uh, jannah is granted for those whom allah jalla wa ala said granted to but do all babies go to jannah allah alam only allah knows and as for the as for the suffering of the babies what he has to understand it's not the the babies that are suffering it's the parents that are suffering and the yes. suffering of the parents is a test for them that's allah jalla wa ala is testing them and testing them how by taking the best of what they have got which is that child and the evidence to this the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whom he said that if a believer's son or daughter dies and wahtasab dalik and he made that in the hands of allah jalla wa ala and does not and does not uh, cause kind of like have uh, like what people do start uh, 
start uh, kind of like against Allah's will and and uh, and doing all the screaming and shouting and that Allah Jalla wa ala will reward them with a place in paradise so, so at the end of the day at the end of the day there is a test in there for 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 the believers as to people as to people that live a long life and a life of suffering allah jalla wa ala again is testing them and that suffering is an expiation for the sins so one way or the other it's either an expiation of the sins or uh, or a, it could be a punishment in the dunya too But the okay, issue of know. the issue of paradise and the hellfire that we do not we do not testify to anybody that he's going to paradise or to the hellfire. Okay, so we cannot say basically. No, we cannot Anything. say. Okay, understood. also on, so, so, on the day of judgment, God is going to ask you how many days, how, how long did you live here for? You know, they'll say a day or even less than that, or half a day or and even less than that. So the relative. In terms of how long you lived, the significance of this world in the year after is going to be insignificant. It's going to be insignificant. Yeah. So for you, you know, you will see, okay, this child is suffering for so long. The parents are suffering as well. The, whoever is in basically looking after the child are also yeah. sad and so on. You know, everyone gets ajar for the patients and they will be getting the reward in this dunya and also in the akhira. So this, like the Sheikh said, is a test for us and for the parents and for the child as well, if they are if they are grown up, you know. So for you to, you might see that suffering, Allah has other plans. Uh, obviously, Allah is merciful, you know, more merciful than you can ever imagine. And for you to think that Allah is being cruel by making these children suffer, this is our perspective. It is our understanding because when that child is going to go to Jannah and is going to when it's going to be asked, how long did you stay here? They might not even know how long for, uh, even less than a day. And, um, you know, there's another hadith which says that Allah will dip a person just slightly into paradise and they will ask, have you suffered anything in this dunya? So even if you saw in this dunya them suffering from some terrible cancer or some bone disease or something, uh, in the akhirah, you know, that will be completely forgotten. And their eternal life will be in Jannah and that will be something which will be blissful for eternity. And they'll not remember any ill treatment or any suffering in this dunya from that one dipping in the in Jannah. And there'll be another person who is a disbeliever and he might not have suffered at all in this dunya. He might be a billionaire, you know, living a lavish lifestyle here, eating all this lavish food and everything. But on the day of judgment, when Allah will dip him in, in Jahannam, and then he will ask him, have you had any good life in this dunya? Any pleasant life, any, any happiness in this dunya? And he'll say, no, none at all. So again, it's relative. You see, brother, it's, it's very different. For us to question about things like this, it's basically for us to question Allah himself. So I would ask you again to, yeah. you know, repeat your shahada and to repeat. May Allah keep you firm on the deen. I know you said you believe in the Quran 100%, but your questions were such that you had a lot of doubts. And you did. You were upfront about it from the beginning. You said you did have doubts. But you see, when your, when your deen is connected with your education about the dunya, then you'll find the balance. But it seems like you, it's, it's one-sided where you're getting a lot of information from science, from... Uh, technology. Actually, this is the problem that I said at the beginning. His problem is that the knowledge that Allah has bestowed on him yeah, is causing yeah. him to 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 go away from Islam. Yeah, but this what is... I would suggest is instead of you leaving that route you have chosen of science, I suggest you also give time to your spirituality to understand the theme, to understand because for us it is a balance. It doesn't mean like you go only one. You know, when you go to the gym, you don't just uh, try to build up your upper torso and ignore ignore your uh, your legs. Yeah, <laughs> you look funny otherwise. So it's 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 you need to your 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 soul 
and your body they are part something of something my mother has been trying a lot for a lot of years what you're telling yeah, me so i think you lack this is where you lack how is your salah brother do you pray five times a day not recently no. so you see this is this is the main problem your salah is the first thing that allah is going to ask you and it's going to start from your qabr from the very grave you're going to be questioned about your salah and if that is not in order then everything else doesn't really matter because it's it's already un, the consequence is already there for that so please work on your salah yeah. it's only five times a day you know it is like when you you know when you stand up for fajr and then you pray to allah you connect with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that already you know it, it already builds up your spirituality and your uh, your confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your deen will already start from there. And then, you know, as you go throughout your day, maybe from Fajr to Dhuhr, you might have done a few sins or something. And then you pray your Dhuhr. Then, inshallah, Allah will, you know, you do your wudu. Many of your sins will be expiated just from that. You know, like the Sheikh said, when, when you suffer even a disease, in fact, even a thorn pricking you, it expiates your sins. Your sins have been forgiven. Yeah, if you have any anxiety or any depression or any suffering, whatever, the tiniest of suffering, like a thorn prick, Allah is so merciful that He that is like an opportunity for you, even without doing any work, He's already uh, His mercy is already forgiving your sins, just for these things. So yeah, as you as you approach Dhuhr, you know, inshallah, you pray that salah and Allah will forgive your sins from that. And this is again like not the major sins, obviously. The, the, the minor sins I'm talking about. And then uh, it goes on, you know, from Dhuhr to Asr, you pray again, go until, all the way to Isha. And then you see, after that, you should sleep generally, you know, and not sin at Brother, all. Can I ask? Again, something? from Fajr, it starts the cycle, yeah. Go on. So regarding namaz, uh, <laughs> like I work in a hospital and my shift, I, I work in a Muslim country as well. So it's not like, uh, you know, the... The rules over here are not uh, very oriented. It is very oriented for us. For example, tomorrow is my holiday. That's why I'm getting time with you guys. So, mm -hmm. but my shift, many a times it will coincide with either Zohar or uh, Maghrib Isha. And I'll have patience at that time. So I cannot pray at that moment. So if it okay. becomes Kaza, uh, is it okay or no? Brother Farhan. Brother Farhan. Yes. Um, your hospital has, I'm sure, prayer places, right? Yes. You just need to take time off from seeing your yeah. patients if you're a dentist and say, look, it's time for prayer. You take a five-minute break or ten-minute break. People take a cigarette break for five minutes or ten minutes. That's true, yeah. They take coffee yeah. breaks and tea breaks, right? Dude, so this is, is Solomon, sir, you're so gentle with him, man. You, <laughs> Farhan, wisen up, bro. Seriously, no, no, dude. I'm like, asking if I don't see really nice guy, in the middle of a procedure. No, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, no that, this is different. Like an so, half, dude, you need to get serious, dude. This yeah. is not a joke. So, so if you have operations or dental procedures, which is like really you can't go and so on and so forth, plan your procedures, right, around your time. Because wherever you're employed, you are not meant to work like, say, nine to six nonstop. You'll be given breaks. You'll be other other people will be, you know, working with you in your shift and so on and so forth. Brother okay. Mansour, brother Mansour, right. sorry. You know the yeah. the ruling the ruling on people like Khabaz, like baker, like doctors and that. The ruling is, if their work is going to intervene with their prayers, they can combine. They can combine. They are allowed to combine. And this okay. is. So, so it's better combining than delaying the salah until until such a time. Yeah. By the way, so Farhan, have you have you asked your mudir if you can get a prayer break for five minutes? No. So have you asked your for, manager. Yeah, for us it is like uh, patient comes first. No, no. But Best have you asked you your manager? No. Uh, you doesn't come first. You come first. Yeah. If you're not well, yeah. you'll not be able to see your patients. You so come first. Seen Far no, no, Farhan, listen, 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 listen. <laughs> Brother Farhan. Yes. You come first. Even though they have this slogan, patient comes first. If you are unwell, for example, 
if you have some caught of serious disease, you know, would you be able to see your patients? You would not yeah. see your patients. Yeah. Because you need to be well to see your patients. You need to be well to do any kind of work. If you are unwell, for example, you're bed bound, you're not required to go and do operations and procedures like that. So don't fall for this time. Things like, oh, patient comes first. Of course, while there, we give priority to our patient. That doesn't mean you don't come first. If now in the middle of a procedure, you hear, for example, you one of your family member has serious accidents or just about to do a procedure, you haven't begun, and you're something like your wife or your children has severe you know, issues of health and accidents, do you consider your patient comes first or your family come first? Anywhere in the world, your family yeah. will come first. They'll say, "Go. We will deal with it. We will. We will cover you." No, what are you talking so about, brother Farhan? I'm not where, talking where? about daily. I'm saying, if at all, it does become. I'm not saying this as a daily. So you thing. don't make into what a I'm routine. Saying, is it okay you, or, brother? It's not okay to miss salah am, on purpose. It's I am saying, you can organize your life and your work around salah times, and you say, "Look, Zuhr and Asr." Now you have a very good option from uh, our Sheikh Ibn Hazm. Even though you may be Hanafi, they don't normally say you can combine except for some special cases. Here, you know, instead of not praying or missing the prayer, the Sheikh is saying there's a valid legal opinion from Islamic jurisprudence where you can combine. But what I'm saying, even if you didn't take that opinion, you can still, you know, in everyday life, have your breaks for your salah. You know, yeah. lunchtime usually is where you have Zuhra and Asr coming through. Okay. Do you not have lunch at all? Not in the hospital. No, no, no. no. Do you not have lunch during lunchtime? Break. So, lunch so break. Lunch no, no. Break. I'm talking about uh, it if it break. becomes Kaza. No, but why, are you really it become become kaza? why are you going to make it Kaza? Why? No, I'm not saying on purpose. I'm saying. This no, but is, uh, right, it doesn't have matter. You have got no. There is no reason that allows you to delay the salah. Okay. You know, even when you look, the the, uh, the Allah Jalla wa Ala has even decreed for us salat al khawf, the salah of fear, that you are in the middle of the the battle, and arrows are going, uh, uh, bullets are flying by. Uh, bombs are falling from the sky and you have to pray. You have to pray. Do you understand? Yeah. You have to pray. You know, if, this if, is prayer. If our, if our brothers prayer. and sisters in Palestine can pray okay. when the bombs are falling, I'm sure you have no excuse. Trust me. True. We are How seeing Allah. this with our own eyes today yes. in this day and right. age. Okay, so how can you say I have no time for salah? My patience. And I don't please. know. And I don't know which Muslim country he's doing. And the, and then there is no mudir or anybody that is gonna allow him. Not no, to. I don't think he has asked the mudir. Actually, he might be afraid to ask them. Farhan, have you asked your manager? Uh, no. Exactly. So why didn't you? You know, in in a non-Muslim country, I asked my manager, and he allowed me to go to pray. He said, if David can get a cigarette break for five times, why can't you go for five minutes or ten minutes for your prayers? This is a non-Muslim country, brother. Person, we are allowed to go pray because there we have a prayer room. It is there on every floor. We have prayer rooms. What uh, excuse I, you have? My question was, Allah, since Allah, you brought up Salah, Allah, I just wanted Allah. to know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So now you I ask your mudir. Ask your mudir and don't let it become Qadha because this is something which will be on your account. So if you deliberately break... Uh, Avoid the salah when you had the opportunity. And in fact, you know, you would ask, like Brother Mansoor said, if one of your family members was sick, you'll go and ask your manager, can I take a leave? You know, okay? you know. But they the want way. to go to the hospital, under the hospital. You say, can I take a break for one hour to take my family to the hospital? You know, subhanAllah, in Sahih Muslim, there is a hadith of uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, what's the best of deeds? The best of deeds. He said to him, in another narration, in another narration, and every time he said at time, so the ulama said at time, meaning at the beginning of the time, don't delay it, especially, especially in times where the salawat are near each other, like there isn't a long time variance between, uh, between them. You have to, Look, brother, 
You know, every time you miss Salah, what happened? A dot goes on your heart and another dot and another dot until that set you will have no feeling for Salah. It will become like the norm for you. Then instead of dropping two Salahs, you will drop five Salahs and then you will not even be praying at all. And with the question you were asking us at the beginning, brother, return to Allah before, before a calamity befalls you. Wallahi. Yeah. What about Juma? You go for Juma, Farhan? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a mosque near my home. So how do you get break from no. your patients on Juma? No, we. Uh, so I'm Muslim country, right? So Friday is off for us. Oh yes. Go. Okay, no problem. So anyway, yeah. uh, do do take on board all the advice uh, the panelists have given. Yes, yes. Uh, but we I have spent a lot of time with you. But, but, no, sorry. Well, before that, he needs to repeat his shahada. He needs to repeat his shahada. I you know do that Farhan? Just say it. La ilaha no, no, la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. And have a shower, do your shahada, <laughs> have a shower, ask Allah to forgive you, and pray to rak'at or something to, you know, subhanallah, and, and get up for fajr and go and do fajr, inshallah. Stop these things. You know, this evolution and devolution and the revolution, all these, all these things, they're not going to help you on the day of judgment. They're not going to help you when the, when the messenger of Allah comes to you, which is, which is the, the Israel, the, the, the angel of death, when he's going to, Although he's not, his name is not Israel, uh, just like something that people say. But he, his name is the angel of death. When he's going to come to you, you will wish... Malik al-Mawt. Malik al -Maut. One... Pardon? Malik al -Maut. Yeah, Malik al -Maut. Yes. When he comes, you will ask for a minute in this dunya and you're not going to have it. So, yeah. so, Farhan, let's be serious. You know what I mean? This dunya yes. is to, fi to finish... Be serious about your deen, please. Yeah. Yeah. But so, I think with um, Brother Farhan, I what he needs, Brother Farhan, what you need is to yeah. have this intellectual conviction that Islam is true, that Allah exists, that Allah is one, that the Quran is true, the Quran is from Allah. It, don't have an emotional attachment to, to Quran and to Allah. Have an intellectual conviction. So, as the brothers were earlier asking you, perhaps, you know, do you believe? So, know for certainty that Allah exists in your heart without any doubt, okay? So, ask yourself and you know, challenge yourself, you know, maybe there is no God and what if, and look into the arguments that we have Muslims provided throughout the videos that you've watched, books you've read and so yes. on. And that if you can then... That me a lot. Like, yeah. you, uh, there yeah. are so many videos you know, which intellectually proves Islam, which Help me a lot. Good. So from Give there, lot of brother, if that's the case, from there, so once you have solid in your in your intellect that Islam is true, that Allah exists, the Quran is the words of Allah, and then in the Quran Allah says that He will test you of some of some of hunger and fear, loss of life, death, and so on and so forth, and also that Allah says that you know He does not burden any soul more than they can bear. But he tests people, okay? He tests people. So your questions about Quran being God and yet how do I reconcile the problems that I see, unfairness and so on, it's a, it's, it's a matter of understanding what is fair and what is unfair, what is the wisdom behind Allah's creating you know, all this suffering and so on. So that's a matter for your understanding a bit more about it, not causing your doubt but what's the wisdom behind this and Allah talks about some of the wisdom so it's just a matter of you know going back to those videos that you may have watched or books that you may have read or speaking to someone you know face to face and saying okay these are the I, I think this is unfair but how do I understand this fairness or not because for you to say something is fair or unfair you need to look at the whole picture you don't have the whole picture you don't know the reasons why Allah has given a child and then taking that child away from that parents, you know, say moment after birth. You don't know the reason because there may be a wisdom Allah is testing the parents in such a way, see whether the parent is actually patient enough with Allah, is still grateful to Allah or not. Various ways Allah can test people. The prophets underwent tests. It's not just us. Why did the prophet underwent tests? Ask yourself. I mean, are they not the prophets of Allah? Yes. Yeah, so what you need to really go... After Brother this intellectual conviction, 
you know these things that is causing you to question about like i i i, I cannot reconcile these things this is unfair this is not fair and so on sit down with someone knowledgeable and reliable and trustworthy and get all this cleared inshallah okay i think that's the best way to approach you your problem so sorry i took so much time of everyone no no it's okay but i think your problem is you need to work on your deen you know work on your spirituality you know when i go for lunch i tell my non muslim friends i've fed my body now it's time for me to feed my soul so you need to do that i think you have lost that connection with allah and what you have now is you have filled your body with dunya okay so sure. it's the dunya is there for us to live in it's not something we have to you know make it as our goal and, that is and not just, our objective and just remember that the person that the person that has that has give, given you that brain masha allah and has given you the knowledge to, and has got you where you are now is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not yeah. you not your parents no one it's allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as that you have to be a grateful servant of allah how you are going to be grateful but doing that which allah jalla wa'ala has decreed upon you to do five okay, times brother. five prayers a day you do your five prayers a month to fast you do your fasting month a, a pilgrimage to perform if you are able physically and financially a pilgrim a pilgrimage to to do zakah to give and you have got, you reach the amount you give zakah this is this is and this is how you are being grateful to allah by doing by doing which allah has decreed uh, you to do yeah inshallah okay brother farhan thank you for your time and uh, inshallah we'll see you again jazakallah khair